Bueno, pues... Eh... Uy. Bueno, eh, voy a presentar ahora eh, otro proyecto que ha estado colaborando con ParticipaLab, eh, que es, eh, bueno, es Beth Novek y de GobLab, que básicamente en la línea de investigar cómo podemos hacer que de manera más efectiva eh, la gente haga propuestas eh, de más calidad, que sea más fácil conseguir apoyos, pues eh, hemos, les hemos pedido que si podían, por favor, eh, idear experimentos para aprender cómo mejorar estos procesos, ¿no? Entonces, eh, bueno, pues quiero invitar a Beth para que nos cuente un poco, mmm, eh, digamos que hemos conseguido que GoPlab se sume a, eh, a investigar y experimentar con procesos de participación eh, directa. Ellos ya hacen muchas, muchas investigaciones, esto es algo muy, muy práctico y nos, ha, nos va a contar un poco cómo lo está enfocando. Gracias. Iago, thank you very, very much. I'm delighted to be here again uh, for the end as well as for the beginning. Uh, thank you. Um, and we're just so thrilled to see the progress on the dashboard, so I really appreciated seeing Susanna's presentation and how it's beginning to become real and come together. It's, as I said the other day when we opened the conference, it's already so inspiring to see Madrid's commitment to using technology to further people-led, citizen-driven policymaking, and to now take the next steps to really figure out how to improve that process, recognizing that it doesn't work as well as it ought to, and to take those next steps to see this as an evolutionary process. And that's what I'm here to talk about today, and to put the request to all of you, users of Consul, to say that one way to evolve and improve what we're all doing is through the introduction of research to actually study what works. So what I'm here to talk about is a, uh, the idea of doing some experiments and potentially doing some natural experiments across cities to really improve our shared understanding both of what's not working and what could be working more and better as we think about how do we evolve these practices of what we've come to call crowd law. In other words, not just citizen engagement in civil society, but the idea of real engagement that drives the making of policy, the crafting of laws, the spending of money, and actual governance. There is a huge disconnect now everywhere, and this is a factoid from the World Parliament Organization, the World E-Parliament Report, that just shows exactly how big this disconnect is. 52% of parliamentarians respond saying that they would like support and help, they would like to do more with engagement, and only 15% actually receive that help. So surely at the national level, even at, as there's so much going on at the urban level, at the national level, there is a huge divide between our desire to do more and the actual platforms and practices that can enable us to do that. So I don't need to go over what Susana already said and what so many people already know here about Decide and about the platform that has become in many ways the inspiration for what so many of us are doing and thinking about. But I also want to talk a little bit about this Propuestas feature and how we can complement the use of human-centered design, the use of better visual design, gamification, crowdfunding, all the features you told us about, and how we might think about introducing some research into the process of answering the question and trying to figure out a, a, an answer and a response to this idea of why it is that proposals are not getting as many signatures as they ought to. Now let me say it's only one metric for success. It may not even be the most important metric, but it gives us a metric that we can use to drive experiments and research that we can actually test, that we can do things and we can then measure, is it possible to improve the numbers of signatures? Again, that's not an exclusive metric, which also has to include questions of the satisfaction both of participants and of the institutions that we're working with. 
But we have the opportunity, as I've written about in the past, this is an article from Nature, that makes the case for the fact that we ought to be introducing into these contexts experiments. And let me say that's not an easy idea to swallow. For most of my colleagues in universities, for most of my academic friends, the idea of experiments so-called in the wild, in the real world, where conditions are quite imperfect, the sample sizes are small, we don't have as many people as we would like participating, we cannot infinitely manipulate the conditions. We have to do these experiments with transparency, with people's consent, and with full ethical, responsible for our ethical obligations. This is not as easy as the experiments that most academics like to do in the lab, you know, where they can make the conditions perfect, have perfectly big data, and infinitely manipulate what they do. But that's not a reason not to try these things. And let me start us off with just one example. Joshua Blumenstock, professor at University of California at Berkeley, studies poverty in Rwanda. And he took a data set uh, uh, that existed already, census data about poverty mapped block by block against geography in Rwanda. And he took a data set of telephone, of mobile phone users. And from that data set, he took 1,000 people, the million people, he took 1,000. And he called every single person to survey them about their wealth. And he was able to use that to develop a machine learning algorithm to predict poverty in the country, and then to compare that against official records. And the machine learning algorithm using this method that combined both old-fashioned ways of doing research, traditional telephone surveys, with very newfangled machine learning algorithms and the use of artificial intelligence. And he was able to develop a way to study this phenomenon that was 50 times faster than it would have been to do using traditional methods and 10 times cheaper. I may have that backwards. 50 times cheaper and 10 times faster. One of the two. It's a lot better. I need another coffee. Um, the point is that when we use platforms like Consul, like this eDay, when we're using technology, we have the opportunity to do research in ways that are faster, that are cheaper, and that allow us then to study these phenomena in ways that we might not have been able to do before. When we have software as the basis of these platforms for engagement, we can do all kinds of things that range from doing surveys with people and collecting data about them, looking at, as Susanna did, when people drop off the site, for example. We can look at things much, more, much faster and much more easily, and we can engage users more quickly in the phenomenon of doing experiments that can allow us to assess what's the experience both for individuals in terms of their participation but again, what also are the implications for the process? What does it mean for the quality of the proposals that get developed? What does it mean for the lawmaking process? What does it actually mean then for how a city council might work? And how do these platforms play a role? So let me go ahead uh, to focus. We've talked about then the, the ability to watch people and how they operate online, to collect data about them, and to engage them in new ways. Uh, and we don't have to worry, I won't get into the social science of this, but let me explain very quickly that Matt Sagalnik, professor at Princeton, sociologist at Princeton, also at Microsoft Research, has written a fantastic book called Bit by Bit, Social Research in the Digital Age. It's actually a textbook, but it is incredibly readable. Uh, and I would just commend it to you that if you have an interest after this in thinking about how do we do experiments, how do we use our own platforms to think about research, he provides a lot of great guidance about actually how to operationalize research using digital platforms and traditional methods at the same time. So he was one of the advisors on a project that we have been engaged in for the last few months that have included our colleagues here at Media Lab Prado, uh, I'm looking at Miguel from the City Council and the, the uh, area of citizen participation, transparency, and open government. So with the full engagement here of the municipal government, of the uh, uh, public company at Media Lab Prado, of academics internationally, very leading social scientists 
who think about how to design experiments and operationalize them. And we put forward a series of ideas for questions we might study using the platform designed to help us answer, again, how do we increase the number of signatures. I want to go through a couple of these and then tell you also where we've ended up. And again, hopefully, as you're looking at this, thinking about what is it that we might do, either together with Madrid to compare what's going on on our platform, or to do for yourselves and to share with others. So in the first place, there is the idea, or there is the question, about whether one of the challenges in asking people to sign is a challenge that's faced commonly in crowdsourcing exercises, namely that problem of what I would refer to as the open call. In other words, saying, hello, is anyone out there who would like to sign, make a proposal and sign a proposal? Well, the challenge with that, potentially, is that we're not actually reaching people based on what they know. Maybe it's the case that if we targeted participation, not only better marketed, you know, told people about DC Day and sent them mailings, as you did this week, I believe, sent everybody something in the mail to say, there's this thing there called DC Day. We know that marketing has to play a role in making people aware, but maybe it would help to increase participation if we told people about proposals based on what their profession was. So if there is something up there about education, maybe we should tell the teachers. Maybe we should tell parents who have children in school. Or maybe we should do this based on what people's passions are. So in other words, it doesn't matter what I do for a living. Maybe my passion on a Saturday, on a Sunday, is that I care most about the environment. I'm a deep uh, activist uh, against climate change. And so maybe we should ask people what they care about and thereby actually push proposals towards them that they might be most interested in in the same way that Netflix tells me what movies to watch based on what I've watched before or based on what I've said I'm interested in and Amazon tells me what books I want to read. Um, what if we thought about doing some of this in the citizen engagement context? <clears throat> Similarly, again, another uh, idea that hit the cutting room floor, as they say, for legal reasons uh, that we can explain, is what if we actually change the way uh, local officials actually respond to proposals? So I worked for the White House, and we asked people many years ago now, and when we ran a citizen engagement initiative to ask people to propose ideas for our open government policy, one of the things we did was we provided feedback to them. We said, hey, thanks for your suggestion. We love your idea. Or your idea is like this idea. Maybe you should uh, talk to one another. So we provided a feedback loop. Uh, and there is some social science research which suggests that actually engagement from uh, famous people, from media stars, this is very well understood in the marketing and advertising arena, is that when you get famous people promoting products, uh, that it tends to get people obviously to buy that product even more than when their friends use it or even more or unrelated to the quality of the product is the promotion of the product and, and who promotes it makes a big difference. So would it change the way people respond and behave on the platform if we actually got politicians to engage? Now it turns out there are legal problems with doing that here. I'd like to push you to change the law. But short of that, we'll, in the first place, well, we'll have to wait to do this one. But it's a question of whether that engagement would actually make a difference. We then, oops, that was my feedback from city. I'm, I'm reading my wrong slide here. Uh, um, so this is the, uh, these are both based on the same, th th this is, I, I explained the seconds this slide. What I didn't explain was the last slide that I showed you, sorry, um, which is the concept of priming. So priming is a very basic concept in the social psychology literature, again, well developed now in the management and marketing literature, which is to say that the way I ask you to do something, the prompt or the prime, makes a big difference to your likelihood to respond. You may have heard a lot about the way that, uh, you may have read the book Nudge or studied the work of social and behavioral insights done in the UK and in the US and in Australia. A lot of their work centers around this concept of priming. If I ask you, for example, to pay your parking ticket and I tell you that you're late 
and that all of your neighbors have already paid their barking tickets, you are more likely to respond than if I ask you in a different way. So I'm mixing up three different kinds of research that they tend to do, but a lot of what they do is changing the way that they ask people using either social cues, telling you your neighbors have done something, using some sort of timing cue, telling you you're late or telling you how little time you have to respond, or in some way appealing to your better nature to help your community. Those primes often make a difference to how people tend to participate. So we have to ask ourselves, would it be worth actually testing or changing the way we ask people to sign a proposal? Potentially dividing people on the platform into multiple groups and asking one group randomly to sign a proposal because it's the right thing for their community, it's a helpful to your neighborhood, versus asking another group, hey, sign this proposal because it advances your self-interest. And we would actually be able to see then, does that asking in a different way, as the social science literature would suggest, tend to make a difference into how people, uh, into how people participate. Another idea that has been proposed, again, by so people from the social science community and that has uh, come up and I think has come, has come into some of the ideas for the new design, has to do with getting people to look at other proposals, to review others. Partly as a way, again, to see what other activity is going on, to allow people uh, to avoid duplicating proposals that have already been made, and then to actually encourage people to sign. Finally, the last, time, the last one before I talk about the two that we're actually doing. So one, uh, another idea that's come up, and this one is actually directly counterintuitive to some of the social science research, is to play with the time that people have to respond. There's some literature that suggests, such as with traditional surveys, that if I keep a survey open longer, if I actually give people more time, if I give them more opportunity to know about something, suggests they will be more likely to participate. There's other research which shows that if I actually create time pressure, if I shorten it, that there's a deadline, that there's a sense of competition or contest that I hurry up and sign, that will actually pressure people into signing more. And this gets in a bit to some of the gamification ideas, is treating it more like a competition may actually encourage people to sign. But again, in every case, what we can do is we can either test a new idea for a period of time and see how it changes, create a natural experiment where we do one thing in Madrid and another thing in another place and compare, or even create, as I've suggested before, the idea of a randomized controlled trial, an A-B test, where we divide the community, the people on the platform, into two groups or into multiple groups. One group gets a longer time to sign, one group gets a shorter time to sign. You can see why there may be some challenges legally with having different rules for different people. But for some of these experiments, the idea of creating an A-B test would actually work quite well. So let's talk about two of the things that I believe we're going to begin to undertake. So one is to test the hypothesis and the question of whether things that we might do to improve the quality of the proposals will actually lead to more and better signatures. So there's a hypothesis here that one reason people don't sign many of the proposals, and not all of them, frankly, deserve to be signed, but is that if we actually worked hard to increase the quality of the proposals, and by quality, what I mean in this case is not whether you agree with the proposal, not whether you like the idea, but whether the proposal actually is practical, is implementable, seems feasible. So if we actually gave people, ensured that proposals would be easy to understand, and would actually be something that seemed like it could actually happen in reality? Would having that better quality of proposal actually make a difference? If it would, then we should be investing time and effort in creating directions for people, in building templates for people about how to write a proposal, in dictating what it means to have a good proposal. But without knowing, again, does that actually make a difference we don't need to go down the road necessarily of investing all that work. So what would happen if we actually tried to introduce a series of high quality proposals and lesser quality proposals, again, in the sense of being 
underdeveloped ideas and better developed ideas in the same areas and saw how people responded and responded differently to those ideas. We could then figure out whether over time in a short and manageable pilot project, again, an experiment, does that actually increase the number of signatures. Finally, the last one is to actually look at the question of whether we can motivate people to participate using what's called sometimes an extrinsic or external motivation. The social science literature, when it comes to doing social good projects, generally finds that people tend to be motivated primarily through in intrinsic rewards. In other words, the sense of satisfaction, the sense of belonging to a community, the sense of professional accomplishment tend to motivate people more than giving them money or points or free iPads or free t-shirts. But that's something that we can actually test. There's been research done on Wikipedia to figure out why people participate. But we haven't in any systematic way asked this question in connection with it, oops, sorry, in connection with citizen engagement. We haven't actually figured out this question of in the citizen engagement space, do people respond better to extrinsic or intrinsic motivations? So in this case, the idea is to run a very simple experiment, focused in this case not on the people signing, but on the people making proposals, and to see if giving them a reward for marketing their proposals, for promoting their own proposals, in other words, giving you points based on how many people sign your proposal, will actually create a way to get more people engaged. It's an experiment, something that we can actually test. So let me close by saying that I hope that we will not only have some re results to report on these experiments, but that we'll be able to do more experiments and maybe encourage you to think about doing some as well and comparing with your neighbor. These are by no means the only things to test. They're not the only question and it's not the only metric, but introducing research is eminently doable and easy in a digital environment. And it's something that I would argue we have to do. There are now a hundred examples of people at the local level, at the national level, at least that we're counting and probably more. If, by the way, you are not up at catalog.crowd.law, if you have a platform here or a, prog a, pr a program for citizen engagement using new technology, we'd love to know about it and make sure we're capturing it in our catalog of examples. So there are enough people out there doing enough things that we have the opportunity to actually compare what works and to develop some really systematic understanding. Understanding that can help us not just do basic research, what we might call the Bohr's Quadrant, things that will enhance our understanding of social science, of questions of human motivation, of why people participate, of how they behave, not just things that will be completely applied, what's known as Edison's Quadrant, in other words, that will help us uh, create better policies that reduce traffic and improve sustainability and do good things in our cities, but are some in that in-between pastor's quadrant that do both, that enhance our understanding of the social science of citizen engagement on the one hand, and at the same time allow us to develop platforms that work. Let me end by... Um, uh, encouraging us to have this conversation about research and also for those people who like this idea that we ought to be doing more engagement using new platforms to change and improve how we make law and policy to join the several hundred people who've already signed the collaboratively created crowd law manifesto that's up at manifesto.crowd.law. It's a series of 12 principles that say to institutions, we have to do more in terms of engaging with people to create policy in new ways. It says to people who make the technology, we have to keep evolving the platforms. It says to all of us who are thinking about research that we actually need to start combining research with technology, with policy in this space to really figure out what works 
and then to all of us as individuals that ultimately the responsibility is ours to participate. Thank you. Questions, comments, or commitments, or news yes. that you're trying something, yeah. we'd love to hear. Thanks, Beth. Uh, this was very interesting. Now I'd like to connect it to the earlier presentation made by Susanna with respect to the two pilots that you're going to start in Madrid for the proposals coming from the citizens. Uh, you have been kind enough to spell out that uh, your pilots mostly are aimed at three months cycle. Did I get it correct? The one that you plan to start within three months, you will collect data and draw some kind of results from that data. Susanna pointed out that the proposal period runs for about a year, if I got it right. So for the remaining time period of one cycle of uh, nine months, is there any visibility how this piloting and experimenting would actually result or lead to better outcomes? Thanks. Hello, um, my name is Melissa Appleton and I'm from New York, so I definitely want to talk to you more after. But my question right now is, um, so our organization, the Participatory Budgeting Project, supports a North American research board for participatory budgeting. Um, we've encouraged all of the processes we work with to have local research partners, and one of the biggest challenges is funding for this. And so New York, for, for example, has lost its research partner this past year in participatory budgeting New York City. I'm wondering what you would recommend and um, how, to, how to reinvigorate that effort. No more comments, questions? We go with this I, w I want commitments, not questions. I want people willing to do the research. Uh, you'll, you'll do, we have one more hand back there. Hi Beth, I'm Manuela from Buenos Aires, and we've been doing a lot of those things already, so we're doing a, um, like a research in form now, and we can share it with you and with all the UCSI community, because most of the things you've said, we've been trying last year with Bea Elige, so we're pleased to show it to you. So let me, uh, let me try to respond a little, uh, very quickly to some of these. So um, I, I'm actually very, uh, personally I'm aware of some of what's going on with Bea Elige. We have been in discussions uh, uh, with members of your team precisely about this idea of introducing research. There was some plans before the currency devaluation to actually introduce some additional social and behavioral research uh, using a comparative platform. I think what's important though, and this is perhaps incumbent upon me and a commitment that we have to make and will make, which is to share that research. Because I think that not everybody knows, people may know Bea Elige and the wonderful things that you've been doing in terms of what it means for citizen engagement, but I think exactly this question of what are the experiments, what did you test, what were the results, what's the data and can you share it, might then inspire somebody else sitting over here to try something. Because I think many of these things, the idea of doing a randomized controlled trial in one city may be difficult in some contexts, but a natural experiment where you do one thing in Buenos Aires and another thing in Manchester or Madrid or Montevideo um, would become extremely interesting uh, in terms of then under sharing those results. So that's something that we're very committed to helping to do, so we'd love to reconnect uh, to share that and then to try to help, and I'm gonna commit Yago to helping to share this across the Consulcon community so that we can try to uh, encourage more research. To the question about New York, so first of all, for those of you who don't know, participatory budgeting uh, was just uh, uh, formally enacted into law two weeks ago in New York City. 
Uh, it has been, at the, for the last several years, a pilot experiment, and despite very significant political pressure, including an endorsement against it from the New York Times, uh, the citizens of New York voted to put citizen participatory budgeting into law for New York City, so this is a huge victory for us. Um, since we've been, at least in terms of political commitment, so far behind places like Madrid that spend 100 million euros on participatory budgeting. So congratulations to you. How do, what do you do about getting more academics to want to do this work without grants and research funding, number one? And given that the cycle for doing, applying for grants and research funding is much, much slower uh, than is the pace at which you work. Uh, so I think there's, uh, there's a few short answers to that question. One is we do have to start to cultivate the longer term strategy, uh, including with funders to get them interested in doing this. Second of all is there are loads, and you're in New York, so I can help you with this one, of social science professors teaching classes where they're desperate for projects to give their students. So free projects are totally fine. Would you get uh, the, you know, would it be a little slower than working just with the professor and very advanced postdoctoral candidates as opposed to master's students? Yes, maybe it'd be a little slower, but I can tell you 10 people who would be thrilled to use you as, an ex as a guinea pig in order to teach their classes, which they have to do anyway. So that's one short trick and strategy. The other is that there are private sources of funding. It's very slow to go through the national uh, science bodies to apply for funding, but private actors, family foundations, private philanthropies, again, it takes some work to develop it, but there may be some opportunity to promote research funding. And then I think many of these experiments, and especially if we think about how to self-organize as a community, and participatory budgeting is much more self-organizing, that there's a lot of this stuff that you can do for yourselves. It is not, uh, you don't need a PhD, and you don't need to be a professor to do much of many of these experiments precisely because they can be done online. I think the one caveat to that is what you don't need is a PhD and to be a professor, but you do need to have some regard for ethics in how you do them. So creating a group uh, that may include some people who are familiar with research ethics and research practices to advise on how to do this in ways that respect the values of the citizens we are working with treating them as the participants in participatory research rather than as objects to be studied, I just think is an important caveat to note. Um, the same guy, Matt Sagalnik, among others, does a lot of work on participatory research methods and engaging citizens themselves in helping to design the research protocols. You really don't have to be a professor to do this. Finally, the question about timing in three months. Uh, I think that's a, this is both a, I mean, I think it's, I, I don't have, let me say the answer is yes, in the sense that the goal here is to pick a time frame that allows us to start and do it again. It's not three months and stop. I don't think, to be honest, I don't think we'll learn that much in th three months. But I do think we need to set short time frames and evolve and iterate uh, and that will allow us to continually sort of refresh and look at how we do things. Do we know what is the right length of time? Should it be three months? Should it be six months? Should it be 12? I don't know. That's part of the experiment. So I think the comment is, the question is not one that has an answer, it's I think one that we actually have to test, is what's the right time frame in which to do this research? How fast can we actually do it? And that depends, by the way, and something we've looked at is what's the timing of people on the site. We know a lot of people drop off, we heard from Susanna, immediately. Uh, we know that the cycle of participation, when you look at the data, you have a spike right at the beginning, and then nothing for a long period of time, and then something at the end. Uh, so the question of whether three months is really the right time frame is the question. But I think it's important for us doing this for the first time to set a short time frame in to obligate ourselves to report back on what we're learning and not to wait a year, uh, uh, potentially during which time the mayor changes office here. Uh, that's an open question, but that would be, that's what happens in 12 months, we have an unknown political time horizon, so we have to move quickly. So, sorry, long, long answers to very good questions. Well, thank uh, Beth, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have to, to finish here, okay? And um, well,